And okay, so get going with Mitch. Um, Mitch, like so many of us that are here tonight, got started with photography at an early age and then kind of left it for a while before rediscovering it. Um, I know that's what happened to me and I know that many of you have experienced that same um, rediscovery in our life. And obviously, if you're here, you know Mitch and his work and I really appreciate that. Um, I know he does too. So we're gonna let Mitch go ahead and take it and have a good evening, everybody. Okay. Thank you, Michael. I'm gonna, let's go through the technical. I'm gonna share my screen to start. Let's see what pops up. Okay. Hold on one second. Okay, hold it a second. Because I'm having an issue here with sharing my screen. I think I have uh, some security stuff going on. I'm sorry about that. Privacy. Or the contents of your screen, it's totally new, quit. Um, see if I can share the screen now, I'm sorry about this. Uh, Michael, I'm gonna stop my Zoom, okay, I'll be right back. Hmm. I'm just having an issue right now. I'm sorry about that. No problem. Okay. And for some reason, well, not there we go. Something. There we go. Are you on? You're on Apple. Oh, never mind. Yeah, I got it. It was just I had some privacy stuff going on there. Okay. So you can see my screen now. You guys yeah. can see the screen, okay. Yeah. okay, good. All right, good, sorry about that. Um, I'll make up that time. So anyway, um, oh, just a little bit about myself. Um, um, you know, first of all, you know, when it comes to photography and myself, um, you know, photography has really been a blessing to me more than anything, it's, um, it's, it's, it's really just been a gift. It's taught me uh, a lot about myself um, it's taught me, uh, uh, how to, how to grow as a person. It taught me really what I'm kind of all about. And it also gave me a platform to, um, illustrate, um, how kind of I see the world. As far as like photography is concerned, you know, people end up being, having big egos and stuff. I, I really, in saying this, I, I don't, I, I feel really lucky to be a photographer that people, um, have, at sometimes um, reacted to my images in a positive way. I feel really, really lucky about that. I just kind of see myself as, as really just being a peon, you know, I'm just who I am. <clears throat> I live in my own little vacuum. And a lot of my photography is really wanting to um, show to my family how I saw the world. That's how I really started. Um, I, when I first was growing up on the East Coast, I grew up on Long Island, New York. <clears throat> I had never, um, I wasn't into art at all. In fact, um, you know, I was far from it. And my father somehow found an, August, an old August rain, range finder camera and uh, gave it to me, kind of hoping more than anything to keep me out of trouble. And um, the second I started photographing, I just fell in love with photography. Um, I come from that black and white world. 
um, when I first saw the images, Angela Adams and Mina White, I just became, became um, I'm hearing some echo. Um, it just became kind of, um, kind of blew my mind what I was looking at. I had never seen anything like that before in my life. So I started to investigate um, and uh, built my own dark room with the help of my dad. Uh, got into like cold light printing and silver gelatin. Um, got four by five cameras, Hi. 35 millimeter cameras. Hello. And um, yes. uh, pretty much um, uh, oh. the Angel Adams books. Okay. Uh, hey, can you just turn off your, your, your um, um, mic just because it's not throwing me. Um, so I, can't, I, I, the camera, the print, uh, the negative really were, were my Bibles. Um, I uh, self-taught. So as a young, like at 18, I, because I didn't want to be intimidated by photography, I got a job in sensitometry, which was pretty much manufacturing a film. It was Codalith Films at the time. And I, uh, you know, would take uh, acetate and silver nitrate and gelatin and a paintbrush and paint and read those readings and develop in different uh, um, uh, developers, do densitometry readings, give them to lab scientists or film scientists. And I was learning how not to be intimidated by film. I think that was just important for me. And then I started fooling around with cameras and somehow I got a job as an assistant for Pete Turner as a freelance assistant. He taught me a lot of stuff about not to uh, follow any rules. Um, don't listen to, uh, just know, know what the foundation is from, from the books that I had read, but also just learn how to break rules and experiment. So I got into uh, shooting tungsten film in daylight, sh uh, shooting ectochrome and develop it in like E6 kind of developers. Um, infrared I started fooling with and I just kind of went crazy uh, experimenting and trying to understand what what photography really was all about and image making was all about and finally got into being able to uh, shoot pictures that that um, felt like how I saw the world so um, I'm gonna kind of fast forward I my trips, I, I lived in my car for about three and a half years, traveling between the East Coast and, and the West Coast and taking pictures and wanted to see the Southwest for myself based on the images that I had seen, especially from Ansel Adams. Um, landed in California, met my beautiful wife, had three kids, had a design studio, and gave up photography for like, just like Michael had alluded to. And um, Back in about 2005, when my three kids started to kind of um, uh, grow up a little bit, I had a little bit of time, started getting back into photography and started with film again, and then pretty much just transformed into digital photography. So at the time, what I saw was, um, I'm not going to get very technical, but what I saw was uh, I had a like a five megapixel uh point and shoot camera I bought for my wife and when I one of my friends dragged me out to Death Valley during one of the rains and when I saw her on that little point and shoot was a uh, was the live view in the back that's all it was it was a little electronic camera but in my brain I saw that as a like the uh the ground glass on a four by five only now it wasn't upside down backwards in red because I had a red filter on it so I went out and bought an electronic camera which was, I think it was a, a Sony 828, or then I moved to an R1, which were totally electronic cameras that Sony had built back in 2005. And I started seeing them acting like view cameras, though resolution-wise, it wasn't, it wasn't exactly where it is today, but it gave me that foundation to migrate to digital photography. So it opened up a lot for me. Um, I was now able to see um, what I was photographing live through uh, a live feed on the uh, on the live view. And um, it allowed me to kind of grow my vision to the next level. Um, I was able to actually, uh, you know, before when I shot like, let's say infrared, infrared, 
I would, uh, I would, um, uh, you know, it would be an opaque filter. That I could, I would have to, I'd have to kind of compose and and guess and wait till I developed the film to see what I actually had shot. Now I could see the feed off the camera uh, directly, and it really gave me, um, it really inspired me. Um, so my whole thing now is um, like progressing as a person through my photography, through my vision. And just like, like every one of us, every one of you, um, everybody has, sees the world differently. I see the world a certain way. Um, looking at like Wes and Bruce and uh, uh, Ellen and Eric. Well, you guys, everybody sees the world a different way. So, you know, this is the way that I see the world. And I, I didn't want to ever, I, I, I don't look at a lot of other people's imagery because I get sensory overload. And I really wanted to develop my own vision just like everybody wants to develop their own vision and not into being like a, a great famous photographer or any of that, all those accolades that people talk about. I, I feel really lucky um, what happened with me for photography, but that's not, that's not really who I am or what I'm really about. I just see photography as really painting with light. Um, and I see in black and white. Um, I've always seen in black and white. I don't, I, I can't really explain it. I have a little tiny thing where I hear sound and I can see like music and I can see a color. It doesn't really affect me, but it, it with black and white, it's just the way that I see the world. So I'm going to start to move through some of these images. Some of these images are the first images that I started shooting. Um, this is like, you know, and technically, we don't have to get into, uh, not into like the big technical stuff. I think the thing with, with technology with me is I see the camera like is an extension of my, my eyes and my hands. So with my cameras on a technical aspect, I have um, taken apart cameras. I've blown up senses. I understand what photo sites are and bad, bad patterns and anti-aliasing filters and all the filtering based on, it's really similar digital to me is as what film was it's the same type of um uh foundations um i still use the same kind of filtering that i used doing black and white film i have a modified camera and only modified for the way that i don't want i didn't want the manufacturers to tell me how i should see and because i'm shooting in black and white um it gives me a lot of latitude to be able to open up the sensor to be able to then determine to filter based on what the light is like um, at the time that I'm photographing. And that's, so I see really photography as really just like painting with light. And I also see photography as a way, as a, like, as a person, um, a little bit of, we're just here for like this short amount of time, like as, as people, even if we live to be a hundred years old, which I, I don't intend that I will ever live to be 100 years old. Um, I'm, I'm lucky if I last another five years, let's say. But even in that, it's it's just a speck of time. It's just like, it's, it's um, it's. I don't even like, the way that I had al always illustrated in my brain is I don't even know my grandfather, great, great grandfather's name, but they existed the same way that I exist or the way that you guys exist but I don't even know who they are. So for photography for me was also to show my kids and my grandkids and maybe my great, great grandkids, how I saw the world at the time that I was here, maybe 200 years from now, who knows? I'm lucky enough to have a couple of books out and that's not from a pompous point of view. I really wanted to have some books out because I see books as being somewhat eternal, you know, that they will last a long period of time and they actually, they, they show, a concise body of work in a, in a certain format. And especially with, you know, the world's of, with the world, the way the world's going with digital, with the Instagrams in the world and, and so forth like that. I think that books are gonna be very precious in the future. Um, so anyway, I'm gonna go, I just see that we're here for a very short amount of time. We're on this rock that's called the earth and we're spinning through space and we're a little speck in the universe. And this is my way of, illustrating how I saw the world. I'm very much growing up was into, into science fiction. I always loved, my favorite movie was always King Kong. I loved the, the Wizard of Oz and the War of the Worlds. And those are the things I grew up with. So when I started shooting, I went out and I started 
when I started shooting, uh, I went back to the Southwest, which were my roots were. This is outside of Monument Valley. I never expected spaceships to go overhead as I was shooting this, but this is during a sunrise um, outside of Monument Valley. And I was really interested in these ancient volcanoes, the volcanic forms that eroded away over time. Um, just like I was ex explaining a great, my great, great, great grandparents that, that period, to me, this represents a period of time, maybe thousands of years ago, that this thing existed in this volcanic area. I also, um, photog so the things that, that photography has taught me, and this is a really um, special image to me, um, and just a very personal image, um, is that I took my family, I, always, I heard about shiprock, I had seen pictures of shiprock. And usually when I go out, I go out for long periods of time. Um, the way that I would illustrate it is, um, when I go, when I go out, I'm so, my brain is so embedded into the everyday um, issues of life, let's say, uh, good, bad, and different, that it takes me a while to detox and to be able to see as a photographer. I illustrate it as being in bright sunlight and walking into a completely dark room. And when you walk into the dark room, you can't see, but the more you stand there and the longer you stand there, things become brighter and brighter and brighter. And that's my experience as a photographer. Usually when I go out to a location, the first couple of days, I, I'm wasting my time. I'm just shooting. I'm scouting. It's almost like I'm, I'm a scout. I'm not, I, I, I've done this over and over again where I've just wasted my time for the first couple of days until I finally get into a place where I can finally see again as a photographer. And usually before I go out on locations, then this is just me, I see a picture in my mind of what that image is that I want to capture. And I'm not really looking to capture lots of images. I actually don't shoot that many images. Um, but when I felt I would needed to go out to Shiprock, there was a couple of reasons. First, it's the spiritual center of the Navajo Nation. And I had spent a lot of time with the Navajo people at that time. And I wanted to see what this rock looked like. I also saw it as a rock in motion. I didn't see it as a stagnant image. So when I, when I do go out to these places, um, I would also illustrate it to me. My experience is like, if I was gonna photograph a, a person, I would wanna spend time with that person if I wanted to take a really good portrait of it. So for me, when I shoot these landscapes, I need to spend time sitting there almost just in a meditative mode, um, getting into what this place is really about. So I took my family, we, we went out in, in the cold and I think it was December. We drove out to Farmington, which is about 50 miles from Shiprock and I spent 10 days out there. So I would go back and forth and back 50 miles, 50 miles there, 50 miles back, sunrise, sunset, back and forth every day. I was getting pretty exhausted. I was getting some interesting images, but I wasn't getting anything that, it wasn't the image that I had seen in my brain when I went out there. And then I, it was, it was on the eighth day, uh, maybe the ninth day that I got up at like four in the morning, got in my, in my truck, got, it was, it was sleeting out. It was cold. I stopped at the 24 hour gas station, got some coffee and said to myself, you're just an idiot. You're not going to get anything. You're just wasting your time. Go back to the hotel with your wife and your kids, get in bed and just be caught. You're, and I kept on driving and I kept on driving saying, I'm not going to get anything. I'm wasting my time. I'm wasting my time. And I got out there and I just didn't let that. Um, it did. I didn't allow that to make me turn around. And I got out to ship rock and it was covered with a snowstorm. You couldn't see the rock. And I stood there for like three or four hours and it lifted. And there was the image that I had seen in my brain. And it gave me confidence um, as a photographer that if I was tenacious about what I wanted to do and what I wanted to capture, but it had to be like tenacity that it's almost like if I shed enough blood, it would give me what I, what I came for. So it taught me that lesson that I could actually accomplish things that I thought I couldn't accomplish um, this picture. And it made a really big difference to me in, in my life as a photographer. These are more images of these volcanic forms that I saw again outside of Monument Valley. Um, and 
Um, every one of these pictures is like a kid to me. I know what the experience was like. I went out there with out there with my son. This is Cathedral Gorge in Nevada. And again, was out there for like five, six days, nothing, nothing, nothing. And all of a sudden the light turned, no clouds, but the light turned right for me one day. And I was able to capture these images. Um, and all I would say is that, you know, we talk about these things, but I th for me, these images talk more about me than I can talk, explain in words. Um, they really are images that come deep down from inside of me, just like everybody else's pictures come from deep side. And I, I've learned how to wait for that, um, for that feeling as a photographer. Um, I was out there with my wife, we camped out in Trona and I don't know what happened here. I guess it was a phenomenon that took place. Actually, the sun is, sun rises behind me here and uh, I, there's a lot of dust in the air and it was a phenomenon, but it really, was a portrait of, for me, of what I was experiencing out in Trona. Trona was one of the first areas um, that like the Apollo missions would do their moon, the test for their moonwalks. And because they thought it was most like the surface of the moon. Um, it's a place that I still go out to just even to practice. And again, um, everything for me is part of Every picture is a little bit of a part of me. The first time I saw Agatha Peak, which is really the uh, geological center of the Navajo Nation. And if you look really carefully at the picture, at, at, if you look at the rock, the bottom to the left a little bit, you'll see like a little um, homestead out there, Navajo homestead. And um, this, when I, the first time I saw the rock, I just saw the Wicked Witch's Castle in The, woods, in the Wizard of Oz. That's what it looked like to me, you know? And I wanted to capture that ominous image. Um, it's a beautiful rock and I've been out there a few times, but I just saw the Wicked Witch's Castle when I took this picture. And this is again, a lot of what I shoot, I'm looking at the light and how the light is, what the clouds are like. This was like a, a, a three minute exposure. So it never actually really looked like this. It was just that there was a, like a, a floodlight moving across the rock back and forth. Um, as the sun was breaking through the clouds, so it kind of washed the rock and light. My uh, homage to, to uh, Moonrise and Andes, I, I guess, this is Troner again, but uh, every time I go out, there's a story, you know, I had to go out in a, in a major rainstorm in California. The, I have a four-wheel drive truck at the time and the water, I had to go over a dry lake bed and uh, I mean, the water was to the middle of my tires over the lake that I didn't know how I was gonna get back. But when I got up onto the, like the little plateau that was where the pinnacles were, um, this is what was there. Um, White Pocket, if anybody's been out to White Pocket. And again, these are just the things that, that, that I see. I'm not, I'm not, um, if I could, if I could uh, inspire anybody, you know, it's just like everybody again has, this is, has their own vision. You know, I, 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 I don't copy anybody's work. Um, I don't want to, but my foundation obviously was with learning from the Angel Adams and the Minor Whites as far as what, how they saw how beautiful our planet is. And, um, the combination of that and, and waiting for the light to be correct um, is something that I'll just spend hours out there with. I was out there for, I think, a week um, and came back with one or two images. Um, but those one or two images to me really illustrated what this area was really like. This is a very surreal area. It's not a large area, but uh, I just love the, the stack of brains in the background and the, and the rock formations. Um, and this was really interesting is from a photographic point of view. So I was, I was um, lucky enough to be asked by the people who run Burning Man, um, Black Rock, De this is the Black Rock Desert, this is the Fly Geyser. So um, I was out there and, and it's brutal. I mean, a lot of the landscape stuff for me is, is, uh, is, is fun, but it's also physically um, intense. Like this area of the Black Rock Desert, I, I, uh, 
you know, the nearest town, um, there was like, you know, 50 people there. And they would actually open up uh, the restaurant for me to feed me at night when I came back into, the, into town. Um, but, but this area was like, when the sun was out, it was, you know, 50 degrees during the day. This was November. And um, when this, as soon as the sun went down, I mean, it turned into like 20 degrees. And it was these kind of things. I was out there for five, seven days, I think. And, you know, the kind of things where you, your fingers get so numb um, that you can't even feel the shutter when you go to press the button. And it was happening to me over and over. And I had seen this picture in my brain um, that I wanted to fly guys up. Um, every day I would go out there and it was just like kind of the same spot, the same thing. I wasn't getting the picture that I wanted. And on the last day, the last, I would say, you know, two hours, I realized that what was in the way of me seeing the image that I wanted was me, that that picture was there the whole time, that I just didn't see the picture. And as soon as I saw the picture, it took me like five to seven days just to be able to get into the mode. I was kind of like rushing myself to get this picture. I thought I would just get a picture of this, of this formation um, by just being there. And it wasn't that. I had to really dig down and realize that the whole time the picture was actually in front of me and I just never saw it until the last like day that I was there. Um, the spray was spraying a certain way. And I, I just saw, see, saw this as like two image, you know, the, an image that's kind of cut in half. But um, Superstition Mountain, I'm going to go a little bit faster because I know time's going to go pretty fast. But again, out there for five days with my family, no clouds, no picture. And finally, that little tiny cloud came and it took me five days for that one little tiny cloud to get there to get the picture that I wanted. Um, and uh, it's just, just uh, again, tenacity. Uh, it's Capitol Reef um, with my son sitting on a cliff, a thousand miles down. Um, just reminded me of prehistoric times and the memories with my son. Um, it took me a week to find that rock. So I had seen that rock. I knew that rock. I couldn't find the rock. Uh, I went there with my wife. Now my house that I have in Lone Pine now is about uh, two miles from this rock. So um, now I know where this rock is. But uh, it took me, it took me that long to find this rock and to find uh, the picture. And actually, this is the second time I was back there. The first picture I have technically wasn't what I wanted. Aesthetically it was, but not technically. Um, I went out to the maze. Canyonlands is one of my favorite places in the world. Um, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the pictures. I, I hope this is it's helpful to somebody. Um, but the, 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 the real thing of this is about um, the patience and the um, believing in yourself to be able to get the pictures. I had been out to the Needles District, which is at the boundary, this is at the boundary of the maze and the Needles District of Canyonlands. I was lucky enough, and I do mean lucky enough to be published by National Geographic. The good part about that was, and it was really the storm images, which I'll get to. The good part about that, it gave me access to some resources in Moab, uh, a backcountry, be able to get a backcountry pass into the maze with a um, outfitting group. So we were out there for 10 days, and we, I was, uh, I, would, I would use a four letter word, but I'm not going to use it here, but it starts with an F. I was an effing wreck. I had been camping um, for 10 days. Um, my, my hair was in dreadlocks uh, at the time. I hadn't showered in 10 days, breaking camp, putting down camp, rock climbing. Um, we went out there. This is the last day that we were out there, 10 days. It got so bad that I had took a friend with me and we had to actually drive him out to um, the, the highway out there to get picked up because he was so freaked out, it was so isolated. But on the last day, the guy I was with, um, the, my guide was like, I gotta show you this, um, this location. So we gotta leave at four in the morning, We're gonna have to climb up a thousand foot uh, mesa in the dark, you can't slip because you'll die, you'll slip and you'll fall. Um, and I'm like, I do not wanna do this. I wanna see, I wanna go home to mommy. I just want to get like go in a fetal position. I'm exhausted. I want to go home. And I said, what the hell? Let's just do it. And 
we went up there at four in the morning and it took about two hours to get up there. We were up there by six, 6.30 for the sunrise. And this is what was there. And I had never been able to get a picture of the Needles District of Canyonlands that represented to me what my experience was of the Needles. It was like the portrait of the Needles. Um, and again, I kicked myself because it was like, why are you doubting yourself? Like, why, why do you fight it? You know, why don't you just, um, so it's taught me a lot about myself, photography, besides all the people that I've met. Been out to this location a couple of times. Um, this is uh, the factory Badlands. Never experienced a spaceship going by before, but we first at this time. I finally got the picture I wanted. It took me about four times to go out there to get the picture that I wanted of Factory Badlands um, outside of Factory Butte. I was up on uh, Hunts Mesa with the Navajo guide for a week. Uh, five days was actually five days. And we had talked about what the Navajos were all about, what the culture was, how they were losing their culture, how they were trying to teach the youngins how to, how to keep the culture. Um, whoops. Um, anyway, uh, during, the, during, the, um, uh, during the time I spent with them, what I wanted to really um, photograph was an image of Monument Valley, which had been photographed zillions of times that represented what maybe the Navajo saw the first time they saw Monument Valley. Um, so it took me a while, but I finally got what I wanted. I'm going to start to fast forward a little bit because I know we're going to run out of time. Trona. Uh, this one I'll stop. This is Canyonlands in the Maze. This is um, the Dollhouse, which is an area that I never thought I would ever get to. Um, before, probably 10 years ago, you had to take a, a raft down the Green River and get and hike two miles and and you know going in the maze we would have to travel probably 10 hours and maybe get five miles if you look at the center of the bottom center of the image um, and you see a little dirt thing that's the road that's what the roads are like there uh, and that's like a flat area that's not rock climbing but it was so isolated out there but I this has always reminded me of like a Tim Burton movie these this rock formation so um I was just, again, I, I feel very, very lucky as a photographer to be able to get to these locations, experience them and come back with an image for me that is my experience of a portrait of, of these rock formations that I see as living things. I just see them as living, breathing things that um, have experienced an unbelievable amount of uh, history. This is uh, Land of Standing Rocks. It, it shows the vastness of the maze. Um, this gives you an idea of why my friend, you know, you, you slip and you fall and you break your ankle, you die because nobody's going to find you out there. Um, there's nobody within like 25 square miles, usually in some areas of the maze, at least when we were out there. Um, again, Trona. Goblin Valley, just a little bit for me, talking about my experience of being tenacious. I was covered with gnats from head to toe and I was not going to stop because I wanted to take this picture. I was in so much, anything that was exposed was bitten during this picture, but um, uh, you know, I, I got the picture that I wanted. I wasn't gonna stop. Um, this is uh, Alhambra Rock near Mexican Hat. It just reminded me of a tooth sticking out of the ground, some teeth. So I see, this is, this is uh, I was lucky enough to see an asteroid just about to hit the earth and I just hit a picture, shot a picture just before it hit. So, but this is actually, I had the experience of going to Iceland. And this is just a piece of rock, a piece of ice, excuse me, out on the shoreline. But it was very just surreal. The light in Iceland was unreal. And this picture is one of my favorites um, just because it, it illustrates to me what the light was like in Iceland. It was all about light and painting with light. Um, and it was cold. Um, I'm going to fast forward a little bit just so some of my portraits of shiprock going back years later and, and a, a more quiet picture of shiprock. So the picture that I wanted to take. 
back out to Trona. I should do a book on Trona. I have enough Trona pictures, I guess. Um, but just how surreal that area is. This is Joshua Tree. And just as from the way that I see photography, the way that I see things is um, this, when I saw this picture immediately, what, what stuck out to me, it was a, a family of rocks. The guy in the middle with the little eye uh, hmm. is like the dad and the uncle's on the, on the right and the mother standing behind and the little, the older cousins on the left and the punky hair, the guy with the, the little kid with the punky had to standing in the middle and they were just standing there and saying take my portrait I'm a it's like a portrait of people only a portrait of rocks so I call that one rock family Owens Valley when I first started shooting all about light and darkness and I I, I always liked this picture just because it was about shadows and light um, about black and white and this is one more picture that I wanted to show just because I went out with my son to Escalante out in, um, in Utah. We were out there in the cold in 10 days and froze and I did not get any images that I wanted. I, I felt like I really wasted my time. And again, we were driving back, we went through the, uh, the Virgin River Gorge on the way back to Los Angeles, went through a snowstorm got out and just before we had hit Las Vegas, I pulled over because we needed to use the restroom He's in the in the wilds, let's say, and um, me and my son. And we went out and uh, we went in different directions, me and my son. And I heard a couple of minutes later, dad, come here. And came over the top of the hill. And this is what I saw. This is St. George um, below. And it's 10 days. This is the last, uh, one of the last three images that I shot. And um, it was, again, it's just my experience of you never know, never give up, you know? I never thought that I, I thought I wasted 10 days on a trip because I didn't come back with an image that I would remember as that trip that I had with my son. Then I got into storms. So I always, if you look at the other landscape images, I always like going out in inclement weather. I always think that the light changes, things happen randomly. Um, nature kind of shows its beautiful self um, in inclement weather. And I'll make a long story very, very short. I got introduced to a gentleman named Roger Hill. I wanted to go out to the Dakotas to shoot these lion supercells. And um, when you, this is one of my later images, but I wanted an image in this storm um, series that represented to me a tornado. And again, represented to me, the Wizard of, to me it was the Wizard of Oz over again, just like the, the Wicked Witch's Castle. So it, it was, and I was lucky enough to experience it. I just feel myself lucky. So these storms, they fight themselves. Well, all I can say is they all living things. They, things have to be right. Um, the environment has to be right. Usually when you see these type of storms it starts a day that's really sunny. Um, maybe getting somewhat in, unstable. It's almost like boiling. The heat comes down, hits these, these, the grasslands. Um, this is Nebraska. Um, I believe it's Nebraska. Um, and the water kind of bubbles and starts to evaporate up in the air. And if the humidity is right and the dew points are right and the upper level winds turn correctly and all these things have to come together. And some of these storms, they, they, they form and they die really fast. Some of them form and they turn very violent and they die really fast. Some of them form, they turn violent and they start taking a different form and then they last for a long period, maybe a full day. And they start, they just, they, they, they're fighting in the environment to stay alive. And what they're actually doing, they're like vacuum cleaners in the environment. The environment is pretty unstable. And when these storms go through, they turn the environment stable again. So you'll notice when these storms pass through, maybe you see this in, in, in the Carolinas, you know, that the next day it's just really beautiful out, you know, when a storm passes by, because it's really stabilized the environment. So they act as like nature's vacuum cleaners for the environment. Um, the, this is a great story for me because I was published by Audubon Society, which I have no idea what the storm 
was doing, published by them, said probably killed a lot of birds. But on the bottom right there is a little house. And I guess this is Walkeroft, Wyoming, in the middle of nowhere. And I get an email um, from somebody saying, um, we saw your image published in um, our, uh, one of the stores in, in, uh, in Walkeroft. And what we, that's, my, that's my grandmother's house on the right there, bottom right. And I was like, what a small world. He goes, how did you get this picture? What were you doing there? And um, this, this storm was a violent hail storm. It destroyed, uh, ABC News was with us at the time. It destroyed them and their cameras because they weren't, they weren't ready. They were having fun out in the field. And by the time this thing rolled over the hills, I got uh, maybe five shots off. It just, the hail, the hail just destroyed them. And, and they deserved it because they would, they'll never do that again. Um, but anyway, a story of how small the world is. It was my first trip out and I was with Roger. And I was like, are we gonna die when I saw this? And he's like, don't worry about it. It's dissipating. It's the tornado's just dissipating. It's coming down. And, but I always saw this uh, as like the, the, the hand of the arm of God. That's what I call this picture coming down. So when I saw these things, I had never experienced anything like this in my life. These pictures are not manipulated. Um, the, they're, the, everything that I do as far as capturing an image technically I've learned to do everything I can to capture what I would call the image the best I can latent, you know, in a latent form. Um, the thing with storms has really made me advance as a photographer compared to the landscapes with the landscapes I'm sitting there in front of a rock and there for five days a week, two weeks, I'm waiting for the light to come right, there's still clouds, the, you know, whatever the weather's like. And um, I'm waiting with these storms Every moment, compositions are changing, lights changing. I have to make a decision on how I'm going to filter. Um, you know, whether it's the way that I, the way technically I'll say that I work is the camera that I have. That my main camera is is modified to be full spectrum, which is able to see 300 uh, nanometers of light up to about 1,100 nanometers of light. So the way that I would explain it is that. Camera, man, camera manufacturers uh, build their cameras mainly so that color looks right because they're selling color cameras. So they emulate the way that our eyes see. So our eyes see between 400 and 700 nanometers of light. So there's a filter in front, which is a, 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 a cut, like a cut filter that cuts light between 400 and, and 700 nanometers of light. They also have a bare pattern in front of that for, for color because we see more green than red and blue. So we'll get a bear pattern is over each pick, over each photo site. And it's two greens, one red, one blue to emulate the way that our eyes function. So they're just trying to emulate the way that our eyes function. I don't, they don't want to, um, them to determine how I wanted to photograph light. So um, I just took off the, the IR blocking filters, the anti-aliasing filters way back in like 2005. I didn't know why they were on there because I lived in my own technical vacuum. Um, I took apart cameras, blew up sensors, wanted to know everything I could about the cameras. The other thing that I, I wanna, before time runs out, illustrate is that everything that you're seeing here is like a eight bit JPEG streamed. My final products are my prints. So as much as I've learned about cameras, I've learned about printing. Um, my, my final vision of everything is a print. So I've done it, a lot of research, I've spent a lot of money doing different rips, papers, printers, everything I can do to do, uh, let's see, museum quality, whether they are not a subjective uh, black and white prints. So anyway, I have to, so these, these uh, storms, I'm trying to photograph them. And again, I'm trying to take a portrait before they die. So it's taught me as a photographer how to make fast decisions. How am I going to filter? What's the composition I'm looking for? What shutter, I have to make what shutter speeds, what apertures, you know, everything that I can possibly do to do the best latent image. Um, when I was out at, in just the way that things happen to me in, in my personal life is when I'm out, uh, when we were out in Shiprock, uh, my wife is who is a, an artist. She's a phenomenal painter. She's an inspiration to me in my life. Um, she wanted to go to Los Alamos. And I had no idea what Los Alamos really was about. I was just stupid naive about it. And we went up to Los Alamos and we saw what the heck happened up there during World War II. It was just mind boggling to me. 
And then I said, Roger, you know, there's all these different storm stuff. Can, can, can we go out, can I join you uh, and chase monsoons? And so that the, 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 win- the kind of winter that I was up in Los Alamos, I came back and I just saw how powerful these storms are. And I saw them almost like a nuclear weapon going off. Hopefully mankind will never be able to harness the weather of these storms, the, the power of these storms. But I came back with something that looked like, and it was just, it showed me that, you know, it, what's in my mind, um, I can illustrate in my photography. I never really thought I'd see something like that before, but this is a, basically a monsoon in New Mexico. The Mattis clouds, the aftermath of a, of a, a, a monster storm. Michael, how we do with time? Are we okay? Excuse me. Uh, yeah, you're doing fine. Okay. And, and uh, this Kansas, you know, uh, I always wanted to see a white tornado. I just wanted to see a white tornado. So I, I can't explain how things happen in my life. I just try to put myself in the right position. I'm, I try not to be lazy about being a photographer. I don't think I can get this image sitting on my couch, you know? So I go out and try to do the best that I could do. And this is just my, I wanted to see this white tornado and, and it was just, what an experience, you know? And again, the, the cool thing about being published in National Geographic for me is, is I am represented by galleries and I had a lot of like people come to me and say, yeah, you know, composited, manipulated images. And if I went back to the, uh, to the image that I showed with um, uh, Utah, with the cathedral, going over the uh, Virgin River Gorge, the, the time with St. George Below, it was funny because I was in Chicago at a show and I was standing there and it was like, uh, well, I would explain it's like a Woody Allen moment where I'm with a, a gentleman and his family and he's explaining this print of mine to his family that it's, it's manipulated how I composited it the, the clouds over the, over, and I just was tapped him on the shoulder and said, you know, with all due respect, you're totally wrong about everything you just said. I'm happen to be the photographer. And we had a really nice conversation and he, you know, he was like, oh, okay, great. You know, but being published by National Geographic, I had to send them my raw files, my 16 bit TIFFs, um, my uh, match prints, to sh- and they had to bring them to their lab to show that these were not manipulated images. Um, that they were only, they were shot as is. Monster in the dark, there was a storm we went out at night and I couldn't see the storm, but I could see the lightning strikes and I just tried to focus in the right area where it was electrified. And a lot of people, when they shoot storms, they'll use something called the lightning trigger. I don't, I just, the other other thing that I wanna mention a bit like about my photography is my, my life is so complicated that my photography needs to be as simple as possible. So I usually go out with my one camera and my two lenses and a tripod. That's all I have with me. I have a backup camera in case I have a failure, but all I have is my, I shoot with a Canon five, right now it's a 5D uh, manipulate, let's say a 5D R. It's a 50 megapixel Canon with a, a, a 24 to 70 and a, a 24 to 70 and a 70 to 200 uh, L series lenses. And um, it just, I do that just because I want to keep it simple. I can't have it complicated, you know? I, and so my lightning, my lightning shots are really just time exposures. And I'm just, it's the luck of the draw, you know? I'm just trying to do the best I can. I know other people are capturing with lightning, through it, but I just, I can't do it. You know, I just, it's not in me. I, I'm techni- I feel technical enough that I don't, I need my, my, and complex enough in my life that I need to simplify my photography. Never thought I'd see storms in Canada, but we chased all the way up to Canada, you know? So um, this is something I never had experienced before, which is a lance spout. So lance spout, usually when you see like a tornado, it comes from a supercell, it comes from a cloud formation. This comes from the bottom up, you can't compare from the top down. And it was, this thing supposedly was about 3,000 feet high as a scope of scale. If you look at the ground level, like um, to the bottom right, you'll see power poles there. I had never seen anything this big before coming towards us. Um, But um, anyway, my illustration, you know, I was trying to get supercells, lightning strikes, tornadoes. Now I got lucky enough to get a land spout. Um, Same storm, different direction with with rain. 
just an illustration of something coming at me that looked like War of the Worlds, you know. Um, I just named this War of the Worlds. It's a stupid, it's a stupid um, name for a for an image, but I don't care. So, um, and and the beauty of these tornadoes, these tornadoes aren't just like these destructive. So if you look at the images too, I don't see, I don't see the world. I see the world being this beautiful place. I don't see it being a terrible place. I actually love my life. I love my family. I love, I, I feel very lucky to have photography in my life as a way to illustrate the way I see in the world. And I see these storms being amazingly beautiful. I'm just trying to capture an image of them. Um, I'll leave, there's some other great photographers who can, who can photograph destruction and bad things, uh, knock themselves out, go for it. It's not what I really want to photograph. And sometimes they get the opportunity to sit there for like, you know, two hours and watch this storm slowly move by. This is one of those. This is Oklahoma. The, the one prior was Minnesota. It also gave me, so these storms, besides all the things I'm talking about is increasing as bet, myself as a better person, as a better photographer. I've never, when I first went out photographing storms, I didn't know that like Nebraska was next to Wyoming, you know, or, you know. <laughs> Colorado, or, or, you know, I just never knew the, the makeup of, of the geography of the United States, you know, uh, that, that uh, you know, Kansas, you know, and Colorado was next to Colorado. I thought there were different parts of the country, but it gave me the, the um, experience to meet the people in these lands. This is Kansas. Um, meet the people, be able to go on these amazing road trips. I mean, honestly, I've been photographing storms since 2009. I took two years off of those years to do other things. I probably have driven about 200,000 miles um, with what we've clocked with Roger, trying to photograph, photographing these storms. You'll travel 500 miles a day is like nothing. You know, we've gone a thousand miles in a day. If a storm's in Minnesota today and we gotta be in New Mexico in, in two days, we go and we leave and we drive. We go to wherever the storms are. I always wanted to, um, this this is a kind of cool image. I just, for some reason, people people like this print. They almost sold out this print. I, I think it had something to do with mankind and the beauty of these storms, you know, the power poles. Um, my first trip out, Colorado. The one before was, was New Mexico. This is Colorado. And I just love this image for the way it says a lot to me about painting with light. And, you know, it was a time exposure. And I, when I photographed it, I didn't realize the way that the light was traveling through the clouds on the right. But uh, I just love the, uh, the subtleness of this, pic, this print, especially Canada, rain, rain bands, spaceship near Denver. This is my first picture I have a shot of a storm. This thing is coming at us in the Laramie Range in Wyoming. And this is coming at us and I had never seen anything like this before in my life. Um, and it was coming at us at probably 30, 40 miles an hour down this hill. And they had to like drag me into the van because I was so enamored with this. I also learned about a lot about cameras, static shutters, rolling shutters. You know, with with digital cameras, I don't know. We can get into the details of those. This is with a static shutter, um, which captures you know uh, light all at once, compared to like uh, no video basically in the cameras. Um, I started fooling around. I wanted to fool around with positive and or oh, let's say positive and negative light, like black and white. So this is my series. I was just trying to photograph things that were bright, white, kind of like white stuff. And then um, it put back into the negative space. You know, when I photographed the storm, I wanted to get something that shown how ominous it was um, as far as the same storm as uh, the picture earlier. Um, but I wanted to photograph it in a way, filter it in a way that was more of a negative space. Again, this is my little thing of shooting these storms more in a negative space, filtering, painting with light and in a positive space. This is Montana. This one before was Texas. This is Montana. And I took my, 
at the time, my young son out saw him chasing with me. And really, the, the, the whole thing with taking my son out was I wanted him to have an experience with his father that he would just always remember. And I was like, Josh, who's my son's name, I, I want to get a picture of you standing in front of a tornado. Um, we, on that trip, we had, so I think we saw six tornadoes. Um, and I think I have a picture later that shows, but this is that series of a white tornado in a positive space. Second day storm chasing. Um, this is started in Sturgis, um, South, South Dakota. We chased this through the Badlands um, into Valentine, Nebraska. And, and it was the most outrageous storm I've ever experienced. The storm was not white. It's because this is like a five second exposure and it turned white because of all the lightning strikes that were within it. If you look at the bottom near the ground, that the cloud formation there is like this, these clouds streaming into this mesocyclone. And I stood there with, with there and I was like, I could not believe what I was looking at. And this is what really addicted me to storm chasing. I had never seen, I was, it was like being on another planet. The ground's so white because of all the lightning strikes that were taking place within that like five second exposure, three second, five second exposure. And I have lots of experiences standing in the pouring rain trying to photograph a, a tornado, you know, and this thing going by. This is just that kind of more abstract image of, of pouring rain. Um, and this thing was like blasting through the fields of Kansas. And the subtleties of, of shooting up in, uh, I think this was, uh, this was the Northern Plains. So I'm gonna say that this was actually probably South, South Dakota. And just the beauty is ser ser how serene that area is, the Northern Plains. And New Mexico, I, this is one of the panoramas I shot. This is just the only stitched image that I have um, because the storm was so large that I could not get it um, in one image and, and without dis, uh, distortion. So I was able to shoot three images that I was able to stitch together to show how this, this uh, storm. Um, it was just, it was one of the most beautiful storms. This is in, uh, in Norman, Oklahoma. They actually have this hanging in um, the National Weather Center in Norman, Oklahoma. I don't, they just liked it because it was to the kind of kind of bridge between science and art a little bit. Art sub subjective. I don't, you know, I don't know if you call any of these images art, or I, they are what they are. Um, Arizona. I like this one just because I put it up because it's like two images to me. There's the left side with the lightning and the, and the rain and the right side with the, the this is Winslow, Arizona. Wilcox, excuse me, Wilcox, Arizona. And this is how beautiful these storms are and the scale of them. You know, I saw these trees and they were just like, it's one of my more favorite images, just how peaceful, beautiful these storms can be. Hey, Mitch. Yeah. Can we do a couple more and yeah. wrap I'll it up? Fast forward. I'll fast forward now. And then the city of Los Angeles. Yeah. Believe it or not, I was given a grant by the city because they saw some of my images and say, you never seen anybody make the city look nice before. So they actually did these giant uh, light boxes that they put in the metro systems of Los Angeles for five years. And uh, this is just, this is one of the first images I ever shot uh, when I first started shooting again in 2005. And I showed this to my friends who are like, nice. And then they're like, oh shoot, that's like the city below, you know? And I just called this one civilization. I just see these beautiful man-made landscapes. They, we build these things over, over the mountains and I wish I could do a time lapse that would show that we're spinning on this rock, spinning through space and everything. We, we think we own the house that we live in and the land, we don't. We're borrowing it for the time that we're here. If we were able, if they were able to show this, I would, you would show that these things would just decay and then build up again, decay and build up again. We're, so we, we, we're so proud as human beings that we have this great house and this great thing. We're just, we're just nothing. We're like these little peons that are here for this little amount of time and just like, let's have some humility and let's respect the land that we live in, you know? And this is just my vision of why I love the city of Los Angeles. I think it's a beautiful city. The first time I saw it coming from the East Coast, 
I came over the 405 and I thought it was as pretty as Yosemite Valley. And that's why I still live here, you know? Um, it's changed a bit over the years, but um, this is just my, the way I feel about the city of Los Angeles. Oh, and that's that picture of my son that I took standing in front of a tornado. And he's like, dad, can we like get out of here now? You know? So um, anyway, that's my, uh, that's my presentation. I'm going to Thank you very much, Mitch. I think we all could sit here for hours. I appreciate it. <laughs> oh, I hope I did it okay. You know, oh, I'm just yeah. doing the best I can, but I just want to, I want to inspire people, if anything, to everybody has their own vision of their lives and what it's all about. And, you know, for me, photography has blessed me. I was, I've been able, whether, first of all, that to be able to, to show how I see the world, you know, and I appreciate the opportunity that, um, that you guys think I'm, I'm uh, worthy enough to be able to give a presentation. Oh, absolutely. Um, anybody out there have any questions for Mitch? I do. This is Barb. How large do you print these? Um, it matters really. Um, like this image here was shot with like a 10 megapixel Sony R1. So the largest I'll print that. It really matters, first of all, when I shot the image, because I, I, this, this, I wouldn't go larger than ever larger than 20 by 30 on something like this. But the storm images, when I shot with uh, some of the newer tech, technical cameras, would go up to 30, uh, 40 by 60. Some of the galleries have asked for things like that. And if I think the image works large, I'll do it. But there's been times where people have asked for an image large and I just won't do it because I just don't think it works really well. And actually a fan of like, uh, I don't know if anyone knows Pente or like Michael Kenna or people like that. I love small images too. And I've shown them because I just think that um, they're more personal than these large images. I get so tired of going to like Photo LA and seeing these out of focus leaves at like 80 by 200. And somebody's thinking that they were like odd. And I was like, I, I, I just don't get it. They, I'm glad they do, but I just don't. Just cause they lodge doesn't mean they're good. So I'm very selective of which ones. The storm images do work really, really well at lodge. People seem to like them. Okay. <clears throat> um, somebody's RR, I'm not sure who RR is. Uh, how do you determine the length of exposure you're going to use? And does that drive your choice of filter? Um, it doesn't, it doesn't um, uh, determine my, cho my choice of filter because I know how I want to filter the light. Um, but what was the question was how long is the exposures? Yes. Um, they range between, I'd say, you know, the, the fastest I shoot is usually about, I would say, a half second up to 30 seconds. And I've done three minutes at times, you know, and a lot of times I'll just determine um, it's a combination of the filter, the lens, the aperture, and the ASA, ISO, ASA, I get confused sometimes. The way that I, I always try, to, I know my cameras with the native um, ASA is, is it ASA or ISO? I forget on digital cameras. Um, but I, I know what the, um, the, the native ASA is. And the only way that I can illustrate that is, I, I mean, F8 to me is where I stand on a tripod at the native ASA. And the only way I know a nat native ASA is because um, I would say like guitar, playing a guitar, a guitar amp. Um, as you increase the ASA, you're amplifying that signal. So just like a guitar amp, if you amplify the gain on a guitar amp, you get distortion and you get the same thing with, um, uh, you know, the, um, your senses. So I always try to stay within that and that'll determine, I'll, the lenses that I use now, I've tested pretty heavily and the 24 to 70, which is, I call my prime, is as sharp as F4 as it is at F, you know, 11. Um, so I'll try to say it F8 and I'll adjust based on that. So my ASA, I mean, my, my aperture is really what I adjust the most. Okay. Um, Hal asks, I hear that you use colored filters over your lens. Is that true? Yep. 
So, you know, some people who modify their cameras, let's say infrared, have like a, a filter over their sensor. I don't want to do that because I don't want to be locked into anything. So I just have uh, uh, screw-on filters over my lens that act the same way as, as the filter that's over the sensor. So I'll have a red, a, blue, a green, a blue, polarizers, cut, uh, um, infrared cut filters, and I'll shoot a lot of times with no filter, which would be full spectrum. So, so it gives me like this whole paintbrush of ways of painting with light. So I can determine how I want to filter the light. And it's a little bit beyond like, let's say what film used to be, black and white film. It would almost be like shooting with um, infrared film that you know uh, didn't have so much grain in it. Um, but that I could put a filter, a screw on filter on. And you could go to like Max Max's website and you can see this run filters. Um, yeah, so I've modified it so that I could determine how I want to filter. And yes, screw on filters is what I have. And I have separate sets of screw on filters for the two lenses I use. Another question about your uh, focusing. It, throughout the image, everything seems to be in focus. And at first I thought maybe you were doing like focus stacking. Is this a result of uh, just using filters and having the cut filters and things removed from the camera sensor to begin with? Yeah, I mean, basically I don't use the viewfinder um, at all. I just use the live view. Um, my, view sense, my viewfinder is actually blacked out with a piece of tape. So I just do a, a, a manual focus and I just um, will, um, uh, you know, fine tune it basically with like 10 times magnification. So when I shoot the storms, a lot of times I'll look at infinity, like I'll look for a spot in infinity, just like let's say you're shooting night shots and you're looking at a star. So I'll kind of try to pre-focus the best I can. For landscapes, it's just manual focus live view, you know? Um, I don't do any stacking or any stuff like that. You know, I think not having an anti-aliasing filter uh, for landscape uh, photography I just never got that. That's why all the way back in 2005, I just took off my my uh, my um, uh, anti-aliasing filter. I just didn't get what that was. Um, I didn't understand why it was on there. So, like I said, I've done every. I've, I've blown up sensors trying to take off bad patterns, and they. I do show shoot in RGB. Um, so my my uh, my uh, how would I I would explain that I shoot in I shoot live view monochrome mode. Now, when I shoot in live view monochrome mode, um, I'm looking at an emulation of an 8-bit, let's say, JPEG. But I do know that um, I get a 16-bit um, raw, I get a raw file out of that, which I turn towards. So I have more latitude than that, what I'm actually looking at or metering at the time. And, but it does allow me to do sharp focus. Does that help? Okay. Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Um, Peter is asking, do you remove the Bayer ray? No, we've tried to do that. I've blown up a bunch of sensors doing that with the, the gentleman, Dan at Max Max. And um, they do, there are monochrome uh, cameras now, but um, I'm kind of getting what I want right now uh, coming out as, as RGB. You know, I think the the holy grail um, would be to, uh, how would you say, debath the image correctly, or not, not um, where, you know, you have the combination of photosites, which the, the image you're looking at here is shot with a Sony R1. The reason I chose that camera, first of all, it was all a uh, digital camera. There was no, um, it was all fully live view and live uh, viewfinder. But the photo sites was seven microns, which is huge for a photo site. And it was a 10 megapixel camera. So I pumped as much as I could out of that 10 megapixel camera because the photo sites were so large, the larger the photo sites, the more rich the capture would be. Um, as, as we started to stuff more um, photo sites into, um, onto a sensor, and let's just say four photo, four photo sites equal one pixel because each one is a photo site for red, green, two green, one red, one blue. So four photo sites equal one pixel. So a 50 mega, say a 50 megapixel camera has 200 photo sites um, or roughly. 
the, the, um, the Holy Grail is having no bad pattern on that sensor and be able to debar de it in a way that um, you can get 200 uh, pixels um, of resolution. Once, that, once that's achievable, and I've tried, we've, I've done uh, Linux. Uh, Move over and let me throw. Yeah, I've, I've done, I've tried to do that and I haven't been able to do that someday that I'll, I'll probably take another shot at that. But right now I'm kind of happy with what I'm doing. And again, it's, it's simple. Not that experimenting with or removing a bit pattern wouldn't be um, the right thing. And to go back onto that, uh, sensors natively do not have bad patterns on them. Uh, the camera manufacturers glue them on top of the sensors. Your subject would seem to lend themselves to multi-image panoramas, but you don't write. Can you repeat that? I couldn't quite hear. Is that noon? Oh, no. So, uh, sorry, yeah, I didn't realize that I'm out loud. I was just reading the question. Beautiful images, gorgeous work. Thank you. Unfortunately, we, were, we just missed the time and we weren't able to see it before. Uh, do you have any show upcoming in New York? Would so love to see this work alive, printed. Yeah, I would love it too, but you know, COVID's really made a huge impact in uh, gallery shows right now. I know things are starting to open up again, but it actually not represented in New York. I have representation in Boston that usually shows my work in New York. Oh, it's not so far from us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, in which gallery are you represented in Boston? It's called the Iris Gallery, I-R-I-S. Yeah, oh, Iris. Okay, I know them. Yeah. So they, and she usually, if somebody's interested, she'll, she'll, she comes, goes to New York pretty often. Mm -hmm. The work is just amazing. The tonalities of gray and the subtlety of it. I'm wondering what are the prints? What is the, how are you printing? You might have these questions I'm asking. You might have already answered. I, I signed in a, late. No, it's okay. So, um, you know, I, come from that silver gelatin world, but my, yes. my prints now are pigment ink on cotton rag. So they're, they're uh, um, yeah, so they're, I, I use Epson printers. And um, so um, again, you know, how I was it explaining earlier is really what you're looking at on a screen isn't, isn't, isn't really, uh, it's an emulation of my work. It, the, my final product really is my prints and I've worked really hard. Um, to do the best I can with my printing. So, um, so prints are very important to me. And that's look, luckily, and again, I'd say from a lucky point of view, I'm represented like by seven, seven or eight galleries kind of internationally. So, um, uh, you know, prints have always been uh, the most, one of the most, uh, one of the, the pieces of the, the let's say the tripod of my photography. Um, the, mm -hmm. That process I put, uh, I think, is understanding that printing isn't like going to Kinko's and doing spitting out some print on of a print. Course, that's yes. a lot of work as far as rips and papers and inks and print and, and have gone into that. And the way you actually photo, the actual way that you capture the imagery. Yeah, absolutely. What paper? Yeah, integral part of it. Hey, as far as paper is concerned, um, I, I need to actually. Um, go back and do some research, but I've been, uh, my main paper has been like Hanamil Photoreg and Epson Hot Press Natural mm -hmm. um, because they've come out of the same mills pretty much um, out in Germany. So um, usually the Hot Press Natural I use on the larger prints because it's, it's a, a bit of a denser paper. Um, mm -hmm. But um, uh, those are the papers. I think I'm going to do some experimenting. I've the other, the other thing that I didn't mention a little bit is I, I, I did take a little bit of time off from shooting um, mm -hmm. only because um, I've always said to myself, I mean, if I ever felt like going out, I felt pressured on myself to be able to come up with an image, I would stop shooting and I needed time to regenerate a little bit mm -hmm. and get really inspired with my photography again. So I did take a little bit of time off the past, the past I would say almost six months. I've, I've shot, but I haven't really been on that 
I really wanted to just regenerate as a, um, and feel like I was super excited to get out there again and knew exactly what I was going to photograph. So I, I, I think for a while there, I burnt out a little bit. Are those images, is this particular image uh, created with the, in a long exposure? Yeah, this is, I would say this is probably a, a, roughly a 30 second exposure. Mm, you had very active, fast, well, moving, fast clouds. moving clouds, yeah. yeah. And there was a reason for doing that exposure. It was both the light, because it was a sunrise, mm -hmm. and the way the clouds were moving. And what I wanted, I didn't, I wanted to capture a soft of background. Mm -hmm. It's gorgeous work. Oh, wh oh, where is this captured? I'm more familiar with your um, storms, with your chasing storms work. Where is this particular one captured? Right outside of Monument Valley. Oh, I see. Yeah, in Arizona, Arizona mm -hmm. side of uh, that area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, no. Uh, Mitch? Um, RR, who happens to be Ralph, has a follow-up to his question about exposure and filters. Um, what he really is asking is, how do you approach the decision about exposure and filters? Um, I think a lot of it had to do just with the experience. Um, you know, looking at what the light was like, whether... Um, uh, I, I think it's just experience, you know, uh, and, and experimenting. So I had been doing it from my, my black and white film days. So I understood what a green filter would do in a black mm -hmm. and white image in a in grass, let's say, and what a red filter would do to a sky and what a red filter and a polarizer would do to a sky. And, and uh, you know, when I wanted to shoot, you know, in an infrared type, infrared's really interesting to me sometimes, or more in that vein in a, um, uh, uh, let's say a sunrise, which this image would be. This is like probably, a, I'm going to say, a IOP blocking filter and a, um, uh, a polarizer. But I do use, for, for filtering, when I do do uh, that type of IR work, I do use a um, dual profile filter. And all, all I would explain about a dual profile filter is it takes, usually when you shoot, um, uh, you, uh, it, it takes the RGB channels and it evens them out. So instead of capturing more blue than red and green, um, it will even out um, your histogram uh, to look like each channel is even. And I think that also helps to the gentleman who was asking about that focus and sharpness. I think I, the dual profile filter has, has done a lot, I think is everything that, that I do, you know, like that filter might improve things by two or 3%. The tripod would increase, increase things by 50%. You know, the type of lens I use, uh, the way I'm focusing, everything's like two or three percent. So I'm always trying to kind of stack or get have every aspect of what I'm doing as far as like sharpness improve. And I think that was one of the reasons why some of the um, that uh, uh, some of the some of the instruments might look sharp to some of the people because of that that dual profile filter. I think is really important. Again, go to Max Max's website if you have any. And that gentleman Dan is really available. Just tell him Mitch sent you, um, and he they do he does really good explanations on his website. He has papers on the way the filters are built and the way he's modifying cameras. Okay. Um, Pecos Bill has one for you. Okay. Um, apparently, you grew up in an urban area with access to museums like MoMA. What subject matter did you shoot as an aspiring photographer? Um. Oh boy. Well, I grew up in Long Island, so I would go out to like um, the, the, the North Shore of Long Island and, uh, you know, shoot uh, those images in black and white when I could when I was when I was growing up. And that, that that's one of the reasons why, besides the weather on the east, the northeast, let's say, um, I, I could not take the cold weather there anymore. I just could not take it. And I saw these images from from uh, out of Ansel Adams and Mina White. And so I traveled west. So I would say when, when I was um, 
18 to, to uh, say 19 to uh, 22, I traveled the country. And uh, the thing I didn't bring up is that uh, somehow um, when I was, when I was um, working in Manhattan as an assistant photographer, trying to learn about photography, uh, I also um, was a freelance for Hashi, was another photographer there. And Canon had seen some images um, of mine. They were just interested in me. And, and uh, they gave me a grant when I was like 20, a $10,000 grant. And they wanted me to do either a book or a show. And I did a show in Los Angeles at the Canon Gallery when I was like 21. Um, and it was actually written up in modern photography and um, which was like one modern photography, popular photography. I think it was only two like magazines at the time. And it's like 1981, 80, 81, I think it was, or 80. Um, and and uh, uh, that inspired me, you know, it just inspired me. I was just, just like this punky kid who didn't know what I was doing, you know? And um, that, that, and all those images were like color, surreal, other, other planet stuff, you know? Um, so, yeah, I headed west is, is, a, is a, a long answer to that question. I only could capture certain things on the East Coast that interested me. But when I headed into the desert Southwest, uh, I, was, I was blown away. I could not believe what I was looking at. It inspired me. You know, I think it inspired me in a way, too, because I'd never seen anything like that in my life. It was something that it, was, it wasn't that it was like I would see it every day. But it's like the first time that I would see these things, I would just be like so inspired, I would capture an image of it. And I think that helped me a little bit because I had never, it wasn't something that I lived with all the time. It was my first experiences of seeing these things. So it was very, uh, so much surreal to me, I guess. I think that was an important question. I think that, that, that really launched me into being interested in photography as a young man. Okay. Um, back to filters again. This time from Marshall. Do you stack filters? No. The only st the filter I would ever stack on top of something would be a polarizer. Yeah. Um, otherwise, it's just, uh, yeah. I don't know how you would stack a filter anyway. I don't know what, in what um, circumstance you would want to stack a filter, except for a polarizer. And, and I don't use a polarizer that much. Like most of the storm stuff, I'm not stacking a pole. I don't have a polarizer on. And a lot of those storm images were full spectrum. And a lot of that is because it gives, it also, also gives me the um, latitude to um, choose uh, the correct shutter speed. Because some of these storms, when they're moving really fast, I have to make a determination to shoot a, at a faster shutter speed. When they're moving slower, a slower shutter speed. So that, uh, shooting full spectrum allows me to, to capture things at a faster shutter speed if I so determine that. Hey, I think our last question for today is Max Max in LA. No, it's in New Jersey. New Jersey. Close Where to you go, Suzanne. Max Max LDP, I think it is. So and again, ask for Dan. Yep. Tell him, you can tell my sent you. Um, he might hang up on you when he hears that, but no, I, I know Dan and he's been, he is generous with his time. He will take the time to explain things. Okay. I want to thank everybody for coming by tonight, especially for Mitch for spending his time this evening. Great. Um, next month on April 15th, we have Holly Andres. And in May, we have Bruce Barnbaum. So, well, can I can I join that one? Yeah. That'd so thank you, and uh, the recording will be up uh, probably tomorrow for those of you looking for it. And we will see you next month, hopefully. Thanks. Great. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>